Hello and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions that you've left for me in the comments section of the Q&A videos. I'm, uh, I've got tons of questions here and we're going to take these up. I wanted to first mention that I went to the Toronto Getting Clear conference this last week. I spent all week there. First time I've been out of the country. It was awesome. The best uh, Scientology experience I've ever had. Best Scientology event I ever attended. I learned a lot. I met uh, people who um, had worked directly with L. Ron Hubbard for years, uh, like like face to face, uh, very much uh, his personal staff, who are now out of Scientology, don't want to have anything more to do with it, recognized how destructive it is, and I learned a lot from them. We also had um, uh, lawyers and and uh, independent people, people who never had anything to do with Scientology coming in and speaking about um, Narconon and the, the, their drug rehab program, which is a total fraud, and the court cases that were going on in regards to the fraud of that. We had a woman who was a toxicologist come and speak about their, their purification rundown, their whole sweat detox program and, and the science, uh, the lack of science behind that, which I will actually be uh, taking up more myself in a, in a future video. I got a ton of ideas and information for future videos and was a bit reinvigorated on the subject of talking about Scientology not not you know for a, for the purposes of my own recovery but just for the purposes of exposing the fraud and the con of it um, it's it was quite good I uh, really now come to the firm conclusion that Scientology is simply and only a money-making scam, and uh, that is the simplicity of what it's doing. And everything else connected with Scientology really is window dressing. There's there's a lot to, to to it. There's a lot to know about it, but really, in the end, that's what it comes down to. So, anyway, a great week. Really had a good time, and I've been looking forward to uh, getting to this Q and A video and uh, and taking on some of your questions about this. So, uh, let's play. Uh, I'll play Scientology Answer Man, and away we go. Stop Propaganda Hubbard, in many of his writings, talks about a fair exchange being necessary between his org and the students as the foundation of good business practices. But since COB took over, this idea has been purged. How do the, quote, in folks square the circle on this inconsistency? There must be some mental gymnastics at play. Am I missing something? Thanks for all you do. Well, like everything in Scientology, I think it really comes down to uh, the number of times that the people are indoctrinated and told one thing while the church is actually doing another thing. It's not obvious the church is not exchanging anything with its parishioners. They sell courses, they sell auditing, those things do still occur. It's the volume with which those things occur, which was the point I, was, I have made in my, in my earlier videos on the subject. When I first got in Scientology in the 80s, and I know it was like this earlier, there was a great deal of stress placed on the subject of exchange. Hubbard's policies on this are crystal clear. And it was, and, and the pressure that was on us as staff members that was put on us by management was to sell and deliver services and materials to the public and get in public to sell and deliver too. I'm actually quoting something there. Uh, which was a uh, which was the strategy, you know, to, to get in public and, and get them services. Now the strategy with Scientology is is totally off of the stress of that, and it's more on straight donations. But it's been a gradual process, and there's a lot of double speak that occurs in Scientology where people are being told one thing while they're blatantly doing another. Um, you know, this is the freedom is slavery sort of Orwellian double speak where. People are told that their donations to the IAS, the International Association of Scientologists, they are directly told that those donations result in spiritual gain. In Scientology, they call that case gain. It's a, it's a term that expresses spiritual enlightenment or spiritual increased spiritual understanding. And they're literally told that their monetary donations are what will increase their case gain is what will increase their spiritual gain. Uh, and that's just one example. You know, it's also the same with the, um, with the buildings, with the ideal orgs. You know, when I was there, 
uh, when I was last there, people were being told that their donations were a contribution to the freedom of mankind and therefore their own personal freedom, their own personal spiritual immortality rested upon how much money they were giving to buy a building. That's, that is where it had devolved to. And seeing that for myself, I, I knew things had gone way beyond uh, anything that was in Hubbard's policies, and I couldn't agree with that. So, so it's, like I said, it's been a gradual process, and other people didn't see it as clearly as I had, and that's why they're still in. But that's, that's how they reconcile it, is the doublespeak and, they, and the way they word those things. People who don't think critically about that will fall for it. Aaron Friedman, since we already know that Scientology is a fraud and that organized religion in general is not positive, what would you suggest to someone who wants to expand his spiritual horizon but does not want to delve heavily into philosophy books? I don't see any other way around it except to delve into philosophy books or, um, or get, you know, figure out, find answers for yourself. Spirituality is, you know, it, to me, to, you have been asked about this as well, it is simply yourself. You know, like if you're not, if you have a belief that, that you're more than, than this, than, 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 than a body, well, then that other self that you are would be some spiritual, non-physical self. And I, I do happen to have a belief like that. I know it's not rational, and I know I've got lots of reasons to think otherwise, but I, I hold on to that belief as a sort of, you know, in a compartment of my mind and sort of hold on to that as a kind of hope. And that's where it resides. It doesn't, it, I don't let that uh, belief affect my, you know, judgment or critical thinking or analysis of information. It's, and if I were to receive, you know, compelling evidence that, that, you know, absolutely positively could not be that way, then I'd have to give up that belief. But I don't see that yet, so I hold on to it. But anyway, that's just a decision I've made. In regards to how to expand your spiritual horizons, education, you know, learn. And how do you learn? Well, you talk to other people, you, uh, you, know, you, ex you read books, you uh, go travel the world, you know, these, these kinds of things, are, are, that's the education of it. And uh, I can't really think of any other way to do it. There is a vast amount of information available through books, through learning. That's, it's a wealth of information. There's so much information out there. And, and I think it would be a shame to deny yourself that information because you don't like to read or something. I don't know. Jennifer Isaacs, do you think media literacy, including scientific literacy, skepticism, and mixed with understanding things about psychology, helps to keep out of cults like Scientology? This besides critical thought or free thought. Absolutely. Without question, the more you can learn, the more you can know, the better uh, off you'll be in not falling for uh, straight-up cons or cults like uh, destructive cults like Scientology. It's, it is a matter of understanding not just knowledge, not just having knowledge, but how to think. You know, science, scientific literacy is all about uh, not, you know, not what to think. It's not, in, not indoctrinating people into what to think, but in how to think. And the people who, who walk into Scientology and don't fall for it are critical thinkers, are people who can see past what's going on. And certainly media literacy, you know, Googling Scientology, finding out what they are actually all about, will keep people out of there. Moran Turnett. Chris, the bit of this video that I found most interesting is your account of investigating the life of LRH and the absurdity of the OT materials and your resulting sense of betrayal. From chatting with Indies, they seem to still hold LRH and his tech in high regard and focus on the evils of David Miscavige's administration as reasons to blow. Do you think this is the primary difference between those who blow completely and those who soft land in the free zone or other indies. I hope you can answer this since I heard some sirens in the background and worry that the OSA is coming to get you for making too much sense. <laughs> Update. On Reddit, I've learned there are some who blow who are aware of LRH's real life story, yet choose to continue working the tech as independence in spite of LRH embodying all the flaws his tech was supposed to solve. I wonder if you have some insight into this since it seems to require superhuman levels of compartmentalization or cognitive dissonance. It's been my observation that people who leave Scientology usually will leave it because Scientology ended up turning on them 
in some personal way, disconnection touched them personally, uh, you know, like a relative or a friend, or they got burned financially, or, you know, they been bankrupt, you know, something like that. Like something happened where Scientology targeted them, and then they realized, hey, wait a second, what's going on here? And that tends to be, the burden of that tends to, they, they tend to put on that, that on the organization or on David Miscavige. And they don't want to believe that L. Ron Hubbard wasn't who he represented himself to be, or that the organization was a, was a fake or a con. They don't, they don't have to look at that when they first get out. I'm an example of that. And I've observed that as time goes on and as people get time and distance away from the constant indoctrination that goes on in Scientology, they start being more open to examining more information about it, and they and they kind of start seeing that Hubbard wasn't who we thought, who they thought he was. They start learning more about his life. They start learning that, you know, if he wasn't the embodiment of all that is great and holy in Scientology, then does you know then does this really work? They start questioning the actual belief system of Scientology and its technology, and then, you know, after a while, and this can take years for some people. Um, they just drop it altogether and they don't want to have anything more to do with it. I think that the percentage of people who I've observed who go out of Scientology, end up in the independent zone, in the free zone, whatever, basically continue practicing Scientology outside of the official organizations, I think that's a phase that a lot of them go through. So I've seen very few people, met very few people who continue to hold on to those beliefs long after, especially after they've learned about L. Ron Hubbard. Um, and, you know, while the facts are the facts in regards to Hubbard's life, you know, cognitive dissonance, uh, the power of belief is is amazing. And there are people who will continue to hold on to those beliefs re regardless of the evidence. That's what, that's what faith is, is belief despite evidence. So, if, you know, they, if the Scientologists are no different than anybody else in that regard. I think the percentages are small, though, of people who continue to do that. And the only take I have on that is that they are deluding themselves. And, you know, whether they're doing that on purpose or whether they just cannot, they're mentally incapable of, of accepting the fact that they were just conned for all those years. And that could be a factor. You know, denial is not just a river in Egypt. Uh... You know, those, those all could be factors. People are pretty complex in as to why they believe what they believe. But again, I think the good news on that is that it's a, a fairly small percentage of people who, who continue to, to grasp onto Hubbard, uh, Hubbard's technology as the, the, the one true tech to get out of, of the trap of, you know, life. Because they, they, they desperately want, there is, that's another factor, in fact, they desperately want a way to get out of this mess that they think life is, and so Hubbard's technology is, is, is their guide, their solution, their way out, and they don't want to give up that hope. Mr. Malgan, thank you for the new videos. My question, what kind of training in Scientology did DM, which tech and admin training did he do, and do you know in his case level? Sorry for my English, I am Swiss. All right, so this is in regards to David Miscavige, the current leader of Scientology, and what training he's done and auditing he's done. What, how, in other words, how far has he progressed in Scientology? The best of my knowledge on this, and I have some con conflicting information about it, but to the best of my knowledge, he never advanced beyond a mid-level, what's called a class four auditor. He, he never finished that level of, of training. And in fact, uh, according to numerous people I've spoken with and what I've read, he actually was in, in the training that he was doing as an auditor, he actually slapped uh, one of his, his preclears, one, one of his patients, one of the people he was counseling, which was a huge no-no. I mean, uh, you know, there's physical violence in the Sea Org and whatnot, but, but you do not ever do that to, you know, one of the people that you're counseling. And apparently he did that. And this was back in the, in the, in the late 70s or in the, the mid-70s mid that this occurred. And he hasn't really advanced since then in terms of, of uh, technical training in Scientology. I've have, I have conflicting information as to how far he got on the auditing side. Um, you know, I, I do understand that he went past the Xenu stage up through the OT levels. And I've heard that he's gotten up through OT level 5. 
Or another person I, re I heard said that he got stalled out, he, he, he stuck on OT7, which is the level where you're solo auditing all of your, you know, BTs off of you, and, and the end result of that's supposed to be cause over life. So he never really achieved cause over life. No one in Scientology really pays much attention to this because he's, he's the advanced spiritual leader of Scientology now. And, uh, you know, what I just said is, it, like, he doesn't broadcast this information as to where, where he, what level he's achieved or, or failed to achieve because they think he, of course, knows everything and is at the top on both ends and, and is, you know, the highest trained and highest audited person. And it's just not true. He, he stalled out years and years and years ago and, and doesn't partake of Scientology, which is one reason I think that he doesn't really believe in it, um, because he doesn't do it. The Elizabethan. Have you had any repercussions or dirty tricks that you're aware of done on you yet? Liam Hayes. Have you had anybody follow you or try to intimidate you? Or have you been sued? I have not had any overt harassment that I'm aware of, which is not to say that I haven't had anyone following me around that I haven't noticed, or my emails hacked or anything like that, but nothing that I am overtly aware of. Um, I'm you know, a bit reticent to speak about the whole subject because I, I don't know what Scientology has or hasn't done. And after learning everything I learned at this Toronto conference and reading Tony Ortega's book, The, on, on the Unbreakable Miss Lovely, uh, which was all about Paulette Cooper in the 70s and the extreme lengths that the church went to stalk and harass her by covert means, you know, I, I have no idea what they're doing. But, um, but so far, my life has been pretty stress-free as a Scientology critic, and I'm more than happy about that. I got no interest in being stalked or harassed by Scientology. Thomas Schmitz. Hubbard was a con artist, liar, and insane. I wonder about the God thing. In that episode of Oprah, when Cruz is interviewed at his Telluride home, Oprah point-blank asks him if he believes in God, and Cruz responds, yeah, I believe in God. Was he lying, or was he telling the truth? Meaning, he believes in God, or a God, but he just doesn't pray or worship him, her, it... The subject of God in Scientology is wide open for any individual Scientologist to believe whatever they want. Hubbard made it clear in numerous lectures and finally in this ultimate OT8 reference that he wrote, uh, this issue that he wrote about when uh, at the OT level 8, uh, that he definitely did not believe in God. He did not have any ideas that there was a, a, a spiritual being up there, a, a big being or a big god or a big Thetan, he liked to call it. He, he didn't have any, he didn't partake in any of that. But he didn't particularly demand that Scientologists follow that dictum. He, he said, you know, you can believe whatever you want to about it. And he said that true understanding of this, of the, of the spiritual, you know, the infinite or the, the supreme being wouldn't be attained until somebody got all the way to the top of the Scientology bridge, of course. So, you know, he just kind of kept the mystery alive. Scientologists in general don't tend to have uh, God beliefs. I know of only one person in all the years that I was in Scientology who held on to any kind of Christian understanding of God uh, all the way up to clear, but generally... Generally, by the time somebody reaches the OT levels, they've kind of abandoned that sort of thing. But at the same time, they might have some idea of a, a, an ultimate creator out there. Not the Christian God, not the God of the Old Testament or the New Testament. And nobody in Scientology believes that Jesus is their personal savior or anything like that. But they might have an idea of an, of an ultimate God. And there isn't anything in Scientology that says that they can't think that. KB Baby. Thank you for the effort you put into answering our questions. I have a little cartoon that runs through my head about some of our fundamentalist brethren. It goes like this. Sure, I'll come down and hold your tin cans if you'll come and handle our snakes. Having said that, are you aware of any efforts made by Scientology to infiltrate the southern Bible Belt states? Scientology definitely has a presence in the Bible Belt. There are uh, local churches, there's class 5 churches of Scientology in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. There are Scientologists uh, down, there's a mission in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And of course, uh, all the way up to um, 
uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. There's a, there's a church up there. I think that might be considered a northern end of the Bible Belt, um, you know, near the Kentucky border, and all the way down to Clearwater, Florida, which I think is the southern end of the Bible Belt, which is where the largest Scientology organization on the, in the world is, uh, down in Clearwater. There's, a whole, there's thousands of Scientologists down there. So, so they're definitely not shy about getting into the Bible Belt any more than they are anywhere else in the U.S. They'll, they'll talk to anybody and take anybody's money. Darth Zenu. Hey Chris, again I show my gratitude for your loyal and obedient service. <laughs> Next, I would like you to discuss the power of conspiracy theory and mind control. Tell us exactly what conspiracy theories we would have to believe to really bite hook, line, and sinker. Thanks again. Well, dealing with Scientology as an example, uh, specifically, conspiracy theory is very strong in Scientology, and the, the conspiracy theories you'd have to buy into um, for, to, to buy into Scientology would be Hubbard's conspiracy theories, and he had many of them, uh, all around the idea that there were 12 men who ruled the world through the international banking system, and they controlled the media, and they used psychiatry as their strong arm to control the minds of people who, uh, dissidents who, you know, anybody who tried to speak out against them, they would, you know, hook them up with a psychiatrist and either get them a lobotomy or get their wife hooked on uh, psychiatric medications and thereby, thereby control them that way. And he had this whole array of, of, uh, of, of ideas that, the, that these 12 men through the banking system and through the media and whatnot were were controlling the world and that they were controlling it in the interests of enslaving mankind so if you and he and he promoted this there's a there's a lecture ron's journal 67 which he gave in 1967 where he he reveals all this and says that this was uh this was this grand conspiracy that scientology was running right smack into and that scientology's that the power of scientology was what could undo all of this and therefore that's why all of the attacks on Scientology, this was this grand plan, this, 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 this huge plan for world domination that Scientology was cutting right across. And so he explained all of this, and, and for years afterwards, Hubbard would talk about uh, Smirsch and, um, and the, the scientists were under the, you know, the, were pawns to this, you know, conspiracy. And basically, Sea Org recruiters and, and people in Scientology will take this information and they'll, and they'll mold and, and, you know, use it to explain anything. You know, the whole Operation Snow White, um, the Snow White program that went down in the 70s, in the Scientology world, that whole thing was morphed into a government conspiracy to take down Scientology. And you'll hear to this day, you can find conspiracy theories about uh, how the how Scientology was taken over internally by the CIA and how David Miscavige is just a CIA plant. And they are secretly uh, have usurped power over Scientology and are running it into the ground because they know that it will undo their evil, nefarious plans. So, so this can go as far as you want it to go, just like any conspiracy theory. And that's why I, 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 I really don't like conspiracy theories because they take the complexity of real-world events and try to reduce them down to a single cause when no real-world events have a single cause. There are all kinds of things going on in the world and all kinds of consequences and unintended consequences and ramifications of things, and, uh, and that's the real world. And when you try to explain the real world in a kindergarten simplistic manner, which most of these conspiracy theorists, are, that's what they're trying to do, it just ends up being ridiculous, and I don't go for that. Cheryl Stokes. Does the brainwashing come solely from auditing, or does the peer pressure culture also play a role? If DM doesn't audit, is he brainwashed? Scientology begins its mental indoctrination uh, on people the second they walk in the door. It's not just something that happens when you're being audited or being you know, counseled in Scientology. Uh, they are working you with words and doublespeak and peer pressure and illogical things being thrown at you to get you to think, you know, the way they want you to think. Uh, right from, you know, the second they're showing you videos and they're misrepresenting themselves. Their personality test where they graph your personality and tell you about yourself, which is really no better than cold reading. 
and uh, and on and on the whole sales process, etc. So, uh, so no, it's not just in the counseling. As far as David Miscavige goes, he was uh, definitely brainwashed or you know under influence, under undue influence uh, from the very beginning. He was raised in Scientology and he worked directly under L. Ron Hubbard. And um, I've, I've, you know, come to learn that he, that almost everything he does was actually a direct parody, or not parody, but a copy of what L. Ron Hubbard did. The way L. Ron Hubbard acted is the way David Miscavige acts, and they they actually have a lot in common. Uh, I think Miscavige has has taken it in a whole different direction as far as um, you know some of the more overt, overtly violent things that he's done, and also he's remolded Scientology in his own image in regards to it being a straight and exclusively only a money-making operation with no thought of, of delivering you know, real services or exchange, as I've gone over before. But, um, but as far as, you know, was, he, was David Miscavige unduly influenced or, or brainwashed by, by Hubbard or Scientology? Oh yeah, definitely. Erica Adams. Chris, will the recent article in the LA Times regarding the surveillance on Ron Miscavige Sr., penetrate the Scientology bubble. How can anyone hear that a man was willing to have a person working for them sit and allow his father to die? Can people continue to believe that everyone is lying and David Miscavige has not done anything wrong? I was never in Church of Scientology, so I can see him for the little greedy punk he is. Okay, there was a media story recently where David Miscavige was having his father, Ron Miscavige Sr., followed by private investigators. And there was an incident that occurred, according to the private investigators, uh, who were caught by the police, and, and while they were being uh, interrogated by the police, this, this came out, that it appeared, while he was under surveillance, that Ron Miscavige Sr. was having a heart attack. The private investigator called David Miscavige, called the church, ended up on the phone with Miscavige, and Miscavige basically told him, let him die rather than go and, and interfere or try to help Ron Miscavige Sr. Turns out Ron Miscavige Sr. was not having a heart attack, and so there was never any threat to his life, but this idea, this, this, this statement that Miscavige, uh, David Miscavige made was quite alarming and quite shocking, and this was, this was in the news media. Um, and no, I don't think that that's going to penetrate the Scientology bubble world. I don't think it did uh, because Scientologists don't look at the media. They don't. They don't. They they make efforts not to. And so so those kind of stories, uh, no, they're not going to pierce the veil there particularly and, and get in there. Um, it's going to take a bigger story than that. Uh, you know, it's going to take David Miscavige being, you know, walked away in handcuffs or something before it's going to like get through to these people. So there you go. Okay, and with that, we've come to the end of another episode of Critical q and you know, I love answering all these questions, and I wish I had lots more time to do it. I'm trying to keep these things down to you know, no longer than about 30 minutes or so. But, uh, but keep them coming. I will keep answering, and we'll keep getting through them. Uh, I, I love the fact that you guys are as interested in this stuff as you are, and, uh, and I've got a lot more other video content coming. In the, in the coming weeks uh, as a direct result of my uh, Toronto uh, Getting Clear conference participation. By the way, that conference will be released on video. I, don't, it, well, I believe it will be charged for. I don't think it's going to be coming out on YouTube. It's a 30 plus hours of presentations over the week's time. Um, I think I spoke four times or was part of four different uh, uh, discussion groups or, or speaking uh, activities there, but there were a lot of other people who spoke there and some really, really great information. So as soon as I know more about how it will be coming out, I will post that information on my blog and, and here and, and we'll uh, make sure you guys have access to that information too. So anyway, keep your questions coming. You can put them in the comments section of this video or email them to me. Thank you for watching.